several people have asked me uh, if I was okay today, and I've just um, had this cedar fever started on me last week and beat me up all week, and um, and I'm just not feeling great, but um, I did get some news I wanted to share with you. Um, I think most of you knew that I had a nerve biopsy a month ago, and, and um, Vanessa and I went to see the neuromuscular no, skeletal muscles, well, whatever, she must make a lot of money. <laughs> anyways, muscle skeletal neurologist, anyways. And um, the, the good news is, is I don't have any kind of infectious disease problem from being in the jungle or leprosy or any of those things that we worried about. They tested me for everything that they could imagine. Um, they, they wanted to take so much blood on one, one day that the, the lab said, no, you can't take this much blood in one day. You'll have to come back in two days. And, and then, um, but she said, what happened, what this, um, my condition is some kind of an um, autoimmune disorder. And it's called an acute autoimmune disorder, but it's something that's very rare. And um, what it's doing is causing the nerves in my extremities to die. So the biopsy showed that I have hardly any nerve function in my feet at all. And then I, I have reduced in my leg. And then it just kind of um, is going up. And now it's kind of affecting my hands, um, uh, my ability to grip something real tight or something like that. But um, so they did more blood work. I think seven more vials of blood on Tuesday or Wednesday. And they're trying to narrow it down so that they can find out exactly um, how to treat it. So in the meantime, um, I just um, am so grateful to God that I can do everything that I need to do. I can still preach long messages. Um, hasn't affected my sense of humor whatsoever. You know, I still open my mouth and get in trouble with my wife. Um, all of the important things in life I am able to do. Um, but, um, you know, just keep praying and, and don't despair about it. Um, because uh, God sustains us in these things. And, you know, someone, you know, a couple of people asked me, you know, um, well, do you think this is demonic? And And I'm like, well, no, because I think... The Holy Spirit is more powerful than any demonic influence, you know? Um, and, um, you know, I've tried every, every little uh, treatment and natural remedy, and I finally got to the point where, like, if you have a suggestion, you have to pay for it. Because <laughs> all these things cost money. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm warning you, if you have a natural remedy, I'm happy to try it if you're willing to pay for it. And I just want you to know that I'm, I'm deeply grateful. The, the missions video was really good, and I, and I hope that we can do this a couple times a year. You probably don't know this, but Randy's brother, Dean, is completely blind. Um, that's why he was kind of, I was like, he's not looking into the camera. Now, that's not some kind of technique. He probably just didn't know where the camera was. But he's quite the evangelist, and I got a letter from him, um, and they just had hundreds and hundreds of people saved uh, in Kenya. So it's, it's pretty impressive. And it is an encouragement to me because, you know, we think um, everything needs to go the way we have planned. You know, and some days I feel good and some days I don't feel good. Um, but if, if, if we believe that God is sovereign and sustains us in all things, then, you know, let's just keep going forward. Um, I don't have time... It's uh, 10 after. Not that time has ever really affected what I preach. <laughs> but um, we just have about 15 minutes. And so instead of going into my hour and 20 minute message um, on Leviticus, and um, I'll, I'll do that when I get back, but I want you to turn in your Bibles. Let's pretend that we're a Bible church. <laughs> oh, there, we are. Let's, yeah, thank you. Let's pretend we're a Bible church and actually bring a Bible to church. Even if it's on your iPhone or your Android, um, I, 
I have, I have a couple on my, my phone, and it's interesting how all the tools that are available. But I wanted, I wanted to just kind of read through and make some comments and talk to you, and hopefully it encourages you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 7, he says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Father, in the next few minutes, would you just encourage our hearts from your word and remind us and renew us and transform us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Most of us, and I'm, I don't know, maybe men are worse than, at this than others, but I, I don't think it's a gender thing. I think most of us generally resist every sign of weakness, right? We don't want to be weak. We, we want to be strong. And I remember growing up as a little kid, you know, one of my mom's mantras was, you know, be strong, be strong. You can do whatever you put your mind to. That was her mantra. Be strong. And it, it's a lie, I cannot do whatever uh, I put my mind to. I'm tall, but I can't play basketball. I'm not coordinated enough. It requires two, two skills. You've got to be able to dribble and move forward or around at the same time. But it, it is this idea that, hey, you need to be strong. And when we're sick, then people say, people feel very uncomfortable with us being sick, don't they? Because we think in our culture that the key is just being strong. Be strong enough and stand up and hold it together. But the Bible reminds us that Christ is exalted not in our strength, in our human abilities or our talents, but in our weakness. And he starts off in verse number 7, and he says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay. The King James says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And I think we forget that this is the the incredible hope of the gospel, that we have not been left to our own resources, but Christ lives in me. I am never the treasure. But think about the Western world does to itself. I mean... The, the Western world puts this, this persona that identity comes from how we look. And so, you know, you've got to have the latest surgery. And Vanessa and I were looking at some TV personality. And I go, that girl's had some work, man. That girl's had some work. She's older than us. That, that, that ain't natural right there. And, and I'm just, you know, funning. But yeah, the, yeah. Why? Because... That's where, your, if you're, that's where your identity comes from. You've got to preserve it and hold on to it and do everything you can to improve upon it. But the Christian is called to a different sphere where we live on a different plane. And he says it's never about the clay jar or the jar of clay or the earthen vessel. It's all about what's in the vessel. And this is the beauty of what it means to be in Christ and to have Christ living in us, that it's no longer about this this clay that gets sick and gets weak and responds to cedar and mold and grass (laughs) and oak and cats. I I went to this allergist, you know, because he's trying to help me because the allergies can make the imbalance issues I have uh, worse. I mean, they put these needles all over my back, and the lady's like, wow. <laughs> she goes, good news is you're not allergic to dogs or sycamore trees. 
The bad news is you're allergic to everything. Welcome to Texas. So, um, you know. And all I want to encourage you is, listen, I, I did a funeral on Friday, and I just trying to remind the people there was, listen, this earth suit is temporary. It's temporary. And he says, what I want you to focus on, it, not that we shouldn't be healthy and do things to take care of us and, and, and all that. I'm not saying that, friends. I'm just saying, but the focus of life is not us, but the treasure that lives in us. And Paul says to the Corinthians, and this second book of Corinthians might be a book I tackle at some point in the future because it's just full of incredible truths. He said, but we have, now listen, we have now a treasure, and the treasure is Jesus Christ. And where does he live? He lives in us so that no matter what I go through and what I face, he's with me. And the reality is, friends, is that God never promised us a life without trouble. In fact, if you read the, the word of God honestly, you realize that he promised us persecution. He says, all that desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, all that desire to experience the power of the indwelling life in Christ will promise emphatic suffer persecution. And so there are times when we suffer in this world and we experience loss in this world where we have illness, where we have trials, but it always comes back to the treasure. And why does this treasure live in us? Look at, he says, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God. Do you see, friends, in our weakness, the power of Christ is manifest. In our strength, we glorify self. And we get caught up in our Western thinking. We glorify the intellect. We glorify the physical attributes. We glorify all of the wrong things, all of the things that he later in the chapter calls temporal. And he called us to say, listen, try to remember that inside Pat is an incredible treasure. It's not about Pat. It's not about Tim. It's not about Jerry. It's not about Wayne. It's not about Joyce. It's not about any of us. It's about the incredible treasure so that the excellency of his power may be manifest. You need to be leery about the exaltation of mankind and how awesome man is. Because that will always disappoint you. Yes, we're weak. Yes, we're fragile. Yes, we fail. Yes, we, we miserably fail. But he says, I'm calling you to realize that in this cracked jar, the, 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 that the life of Christ radiates through you. It's not in your perfection. It's in your brokenness that Christ is revealed. You know, we've all been in church. Most of us all here have been in church quite a few years, haven't we? And is there anything more difficult to deal with than perceived perfection? I say perceived perfection. Religious people who think they've got their act together. It's impossible to live with them. Because it's all about how good they are. And the gospel isn't good news to people who don't realize they aren't that good. No, but in my depressions, in my struggles, in my weakness, in my illness, in, in my brokenness, then the power of Christ can be revealed. The fragrance of Christ can be released. And then he says, and not to us. Do you see, friends, it's never even about our gifts and our abilities. All of those should continue to point people back to the indwelling power. They should all take our eyes to the vertical place. Now look at verse number eight. He says, we are afflicted in every way. There's some people who say, well, you can never say, you never say a negative word. Never say a negative word. Paul didn't have that theology. 
And I understand, you don't want to be negative for the sake of being negative. But Paul, the great missionary apostle, he suffered physical illness, he suffered persecution, suffering trials. You read through Corinthians, man, he gets, he's cast into the open sea. He's beaten with, with rods. He suffered in prison, every kind of thing. He, couldn't. he says, listen, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Yes, we are going to experience times when we are afflicted when we suffer persecution, when we suffer trials, but not crushed. Why? It goes back to verse seven. You see, when it's all about how strong you are, who do people see? But when you're afflicted and people begin to smell the fragrance of Christ, who does it point to? So you see someone who's suffering with some kind of illness or cancer or or, or to, and, you, and you see a radiance from them that is supernatural, who does it point you to? That you could never see even in their health. Because the whole purpose is to proclaim the excellency not of our power or our ability, but the excellency of Christ. We're perplexed. You ever been perplexed? I think that's one of the hardest things about what I'm going through. Seven months, I'm waiting for an answer. Walked out of the, the doctor's office a couple weeks ago and said, you know, there's a reason they call it practice. <laughs> a lot of practice going on. All right? No, I thank God for all of them, and I really do. I've, I've had wonderful doctors. I have no complaints about them, but, you know, when the, when the doctor sees you and says, well, you, you're, you're a difficult case, I go, you know, my wife's been saying that for 35 years. <laughs> Sometimes we don't understand. Like, why me? Why now? Don't you ever get there? Maybe it's a financial difficulty. Maybe your health is great, but you're wondering, why am I struggling? I've been faithful to the Lord. Why me? Why now? Perplexed, yes, but not driven to despair. Because even though we don't understand... We know in the end that there's a sovereign God that we serve. And I'm in his hand. There have been times when I felt, you know, a certain element of like, will this ever end? And it will, one way or the other. But can I trust him? And that's why you need, I need, we all need people in our lives to remember it's not about us these jars of clay, it's about the treasure that lives within us, persecuted, but not forsaken. Sometimes, you know, in America, we, we don't suffer persecution in the sense that maybe they do in China or Afghanistan or Iraq or Iran, where people lose their lives for the gospel. But if you give your life wholly over to the sovereign lordship of Christ, it changes your attitudes about things. And you'll be mocked even in the Western world, even here in Texas. And he says, yes, perplexed, but what? Not forsaken. Why? Because where's the treasure? The treasure is not distant to me. The treasure is in me. We, we sometimes look up to, to heaven and say, Lord, but really we should be going, Lord. Because he's not way up there, he's right here, not forsaken. He promises us in the scripture, I will never leave you nor forsake you. No matter what trial you're in, I will go through the trial. The Lord is so committed to his union with us that he goes with us in our successes and in our failures. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? 
You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, he told the Corinthians, and only in Corinth would you have this going on. He said, like, when you go into a prostitute, you take Christ into a prostitute. No, 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 pastor. Jesus must, uh, he, he must evacuate before we sin. No, no evacuation. He's committed to us. He's not saying there's not consequences. He, he's saying, listen, I'm committed to you. In your success, I'm with you. In your strength, I'm with you. But in your failure, I'm with you. In your weakness, I'm with you. In sickness, I'm with you. In life, I'm with you. In death, I'm with you. Struck down, but not destroyed. Paul experienced this so many times. But then verse 10 says, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. So I want to ask you, because I had to come to this place, and I say I have come to this place, but probably more accurate is I'm in this place, kind of struggling through this place, because I read and the Lord says, you know, give thanks for all things, and, you know, I sit there and I go, well, you know... I got a little attitude about this right now. I think I don't deserve this, but then I think, well, do I want what I deserve? So let's move on, right? I don't deserve this. Have you ever felt that way? Well, then let the Lord illuminate your understanding to what you do deserve. Amen. And you'll be like, oh, I don't want to go there. But he reminds his friends, that it's all about the manifestation of the life of Jesus. So I wanted to ask you as we wrap it up, will you truly accept whatever God desires as your best for the revelation of Christ through you? You see, we think, well, it glorifies God if I have a million dollars to give the church, and I hope you will. I keep telling everyone, if I win the lottery, I'm giving most of it to the church. Katie was like, but dad, you don't play the lottery. I go, I know, but if I win. <laughs> but do you realize that sometimes people see and experience the power and life of Christ more in your, your hardships than in your prosperity? Let Christ be evident in your good health. Amen. But let Christ be evident supernaturally in your illness. In your strength, let him be evident. But in your weakness, let him be evident. Because he's calling us to a place where we, we come to the end of ourselves and the end of our resources and in our weakness to let people see and experience the fragrance of Christ flowing through us. What is it that you hunger for? I, I can't help you if all you want is a religion about knowing things. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I'm, I'm tired of that. I want a relationship of experience and intimacy, even if that means I don't know everything. And for, if I need to be sick for seven months or seven years or whatever it is so that people can see Christ flowing through me in weakness, then I will learn to thank him. Even if I don't feel it. Because sometimes we don't feel it. Now, verse 16 says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. I know, friends. I know. I'm with you. They don't seem like light afflictions. 
But whatever trial, heartache, despair, whatever you've been going through, he's saying in comparison to the future glory, we won't even remember it. Father, bless your people. And I pray that you would work mightily in us and through us. That, Lord, no matter where we are and what we do, that you would be evident in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.